Dear colleagues, thank you for tuning in on this webinar in which we will discuss endometrial receptivity and how to optimally prepare for embryo transfer. First of all, I would like to thank Cooper Surgical for providing this platform and for giving me the opportunity to discuss this interesting item with you. Here you see uh, my conflicts of interest and the conflicts of interest of my institution. When we look at this graph, we see that implantation is the rate limiting step in ART today. You can see that just prior to or just post implantation, about 60% of the embryos are lost. If we want an implantation to occur, there are two players. One is the blastocyst, which we want to be of optimal quality, and the second player is the endometrium. Of course, these two, on top of that, they need to interact with each other in order to provide an implantation which can then continue uh, until a live birth. We cannot underestimate the impact of the embryo. The embryo and the quality of the embryo is of crucial importance, as has been shown very recently in this um, nice paper uh, published in Fertility Sterility, in which they show that if you have the potential to transfer three successive euploid blastocysts, that you reach an implantation rate cumulatively seen of 95%. This shows us that the embryo has a pivotal role in giving implantation. Of course, the endometrium is important as well. And the task of the endometrium is actually twofold. One, the endometrium needs to be receptive. But probably on the other side, there's also a selectivity function um, that needs to be provided by the endometrium. When we perform ovarian stimulation, we ask a lot of the endometrium. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see the natural cycle in which everything naturally happens in sync. However, when we stimulate the ovaries due to the high levels of estradiol in the serum, we see that the embryo and the endometrium are not in sync anymore. We know that after ovarian stimulation, if we want to transfer the embryo fresh in the same cycle, that we need to supplement the luteal phase. In this Cochrane review, you see that clearly there is an advantage of giving luteal phase support after ovarian stimulation. However, if we ask ourselves the question on how to supplement a luteal phase, the evidence is less clear. There are different molecules uh, to use, different routes to use, and um, when you compare all these RCTs, there seems to be um, no um, advantage of using one over the other. However, uh, the Cochrane Review also states that most of this uh, evidence is of low to very low quality. In this context, I would like to draw your attention to the molecule of didrogesterone, which is the oral progesterone compound. In the slide you see here, you see data recently published by Griesinger et al. It's actually a meta-analysis that includes the two large uh, Lotus RCTs, both including more than 1,000 patients combined with previous studies, also uh, looking at the, um, the effect of didrogesterone. And what you see in the meta-analysis is that the odds ratio is in favor for the outcome of live birth in favor of didrogesterone when compared to the micronized vaginal uh, progesterone. This is interesting uh, data to keep in mind, which uh, have the potential to reshape the use of didrogesterone for luteal uh, phase support in the future. 
We know that we have two supplements, the luteal phase uh, after ovarian simulation if we want to uh, perform fresh embryo transfer, but what about other things? What about the juvenile therapies? What about add-ons? Uh, you know, um, as well as I, that there is a plethora of uh, add-ons that we can use in ART, um, going from uh, immune therapies uh, over additional medication, uh, checking the uh, microbiome, etc., etc., what I would like uh, to discuss with you uh, in this context is um, the impact that these non-evidence-based uh, add-ons have on our clinical practice and on the, the evolution of uh, our research. Um, in uh, this uh, graph, um, nicely provided by Lensen et al. in 2019, you see that actually we create a vicious circle by using these add-ons in a non-evidence-based setting in clinical practice. I think it is very important for all of these issues to keep in mind that we need RCTs before we apply the add-ons in clinic. I picked one add-on to discuss with you today, which is the add-on of endometrial scratching. Here you see the origin, you see the hypothesis, which actually comes from animal studies. On the, the right uh, side you see uh, the uterus of mice, in which you see that when the uterus is scratched that there are more implantation sites. On the right side of the slide, you see a potential uh, hypothesis, a potential explanation, uh, which consists of the fact that immune cells are recruited towards the endometrium by the uh, intervention of the scratching, and that these immune cells stay resident there for a while, and that they might assist the implantation in a following phase. However, if we scratch, then the next question is how to scratch. And there you see that all of the studies that have been performed are very scattered. You can scratch with a pipel biopsy. You can have a scratching-like effect by performing a hysteroscopy. And then you also have to take into account the moment of the cycle in which the intervention is done. For uh, scratching, in the beginning, there were uh, RCTs, uh, small RCTs, showing a uh, beneficial effect. However, in the meantime, we have access to better data, larger RCTs, for example, the uh, paper by Lensen et al., large RCT published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019, in which you see that the live birth rate after scratching versus in the control group is exactly the same with the adjusted odds ratio of 1. This summer, during the ESHRAE meeting, two other large RCTs have been uh, presented. One, um, the first one, is a study by the group of Utrecht, the group of uh, Professor Broekmans in which patients were scratched that had at least one complete failed ART cycle. You see here that the live birth rate after one year of follow-up was not significantly different in the group that was scratched versus the control group. In the UK, another large RCT has been performed. These data have also been presented at this year's ESHRAE meeting. In this case, the intervention was done for naive IVF patients, so never uh, having performed a ART cycle before. The conclusion was the same. The scratching did not increase the outcome. So it is not better, it is not beneficial, but are we sure that it is safe? Here I show you the data um, of our own paper 
We also performed a scratching study, but we did not scratch like most other studies in the luteal phase. But we went for a scratching intervention during the ovarian stimulation. In the early proliferative phase, we performed a pipel biopsy between day 6 or day 8 of the ovarian stimulation. You see that for our primary outcome, which was the clinical pregnancy rate, there was no difference, not in the intention to treat and not in the per protocol analysis. However, we needed to interrupt our study prematurely because in a second interim analysis, we were faced with a higher rate of clinical miscarriages. So when uh, you scratch you really need to take into account the moment of the scratching and we were able um, to show that we, we, we are quite concerned uh, if a scratch is performed in the follicular phase of ovarian stimulation. Now what if we would completely circumvent the negative impact of ovarian stimulation on the endometrium and what if we would go for a freeze-all strategy for all patients. We stimulate, we trigger with an agonist, we freeze all the embryos and we routinely go for frozen embryo transfer. This question is really a hot topic today and uh, a very nice opinion paper has been written by uh, many of our prominent colleagues. Here you see the main table of this opinion paper and you see that the answer on the question should we still perform fresh embryo transfer is probably different taking into account different patient populations. Clearly there are situations in which a fresh embryo transfer is better avoided or rather unpractical like for example in case of elevated uh, progesterone at the moment of uh, ovulation triggering or when uh, pre-implantation genetic testing is done. But on top of that, it's probably very uh, important to take into account a normal versus a high response. In case of hyper response, we should be careful and we should really try to avoid the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. In that context, we have uh, performed recently a randomized control trial specifically focusing on patients at risk for OHSS. So you see here the inclusion criteria. We um, included patients when they had at least 18 follicles of at least 11 uh, millimeters at the moment that they needed to be triggered. And we divided uh, the group RCT-wise uh, in two arms, a first arm in which agonist triggering was followed by the freeze-all strategy and a frozen embryo transfer in a successive cycle versus the agonist triggering with an intensified luteal phase support consisting of a small dose of HCG the day of the uh, pickup followed by an estradiol and progesterone supplementation with a fresh embryo transfer. Here you see our results. Let's first focus on the reproductive outcome. So on the right uh, side, you see the intention to treat analysis of the reproductive outcomes. Our primary outcome was the clinical uh, pregnancy rate. And you see that there was no uh, statistically significant difference in clinical pregnancy rates whether the uh, freeze-all strategy was applied or whether the intensified luteal phase support with fresh embryo transfer was applied. However, and this you see on the left side, we saw a significant difference in the incidence of moderate to severe OHSS with not a single case after agonist triggering and freeze-all versus nine um, cases with agonist uh, triggering and low-dose HCG intensified luteal phase support. The conclusion of our study was thus that in case of hyper-response, the freeze-all strategy gave us a comparable 
efficiency, but better safety. Nevertheless, also for frozen embryo transfer, there are questions regarding the safety. Associations have been made with babies that are large for gestational age and um, a higher incidence of preeclampsia and hypertensive disorders is suspected. Probably within this matter, we should take into account the way that the endometrium is prepared for the frozen embryo transfer. So one option is that indeed these associations are linked to the vitrification of the embryo, but another uh, is linked to the preparation of the endometrium. When you look at the uh, Cochrane uh, analysis that looks at the, um, the different outcomes reproductive wise in function of the uh, preparation methods, you see that there was insufficient evidence to support uh, one or the other, but that again, like for the luteal phase support in fresh embryo transfer, the quality uh, of the uh, included studies was low. If we are thinking on the um, possible safety concerns with frozen embryo transfer, we should probably zoom in a little bit more on the hormonal replacement therapy um, to prepare the frozen embryo transfer. When we use the HRT cycle, the corpus luteum is completely absent in that cycle. And as you see here on the slide, the corpus luteum provides progesterone, but also provides many other molecules like relaxin, like uh, VEGF. And all these molecules, they are known to interact within the process of implantation. And when you look at one of the main hypotheses on, uh, on the origin of the development of preeclampsia, you see that a decreased invasion of the spiral arteries linked to a different immune system at the level of the endometrium is probably of very high importance. Indeed, when you look at the current literature, you see that um, many papers arise that consolidate this impression that the absence of the corpus luteum increases the risks of developing hypertensive disorders and preeclampsia. We uh, had a look in our own data and we also compared retrospectively our frozen embryo transfers in a natural cycle versus in the HRT cycle and we saw exactly the same, a higher uh, rate of preeclampsia, a higher rate of gestational uh, hypertension in the crude results, but also when corrected for confounders, the impact of the HRT cycle on the uh, prevalence, on the incidence of uh, preeclampsia remained statistically significant. Of course, another very interesting concept within this matter is the individualization of the luteal phase support in uh, HRT for frozen embryo transfer cycles. As shown by this landmark paper by Labarta and her team in uh, 2017, you see that there is an impact of the serum progesterone level around the moment uh, of the frozen embryo transfer and the outcome. Eh? You see that there were uh, uh, less uh, clinical pregnancies when a certain cutoff uh, in this paper 9.2 uh, was not reached and you see that there was a statistically significant uh, lower uh, rate of ongoing pregnancies. The next question here is whether um, an increase in the luteal phase support might rescue um, the luteal phase and might give better results after the frozen embryo transfer. And I think that this is a uh, question where multiple research teams are working on today and we will, um, we will be able to see uh, those data in the very near future.
being aware of the concerns uh, with HRT, uh, being aware of the impact of the uh, corpus luteum, one might think that it is best to go back to nature and to just use the natural cycle if the natural cycle is present uh, for frozen embryo transfer. This is definitely an option for patients having a regular cycle. It's uh, a uh, treatment uh, modality that we have been using in our center for a uh, long time. And we were wondering a couple of years ago whether in case of using this natural cycle, whether it is better to wait for a spontaneous ovulation or whether it is better to trigger the ovulation with the HCG. I show you here the answers that have been provided by the RCT that we performed. So you see uh, the intention to treat analysis as well as the per protocol analysis. And you see that for our main primary outcome, which was the clinical pregnancy rate, there was no difference between the pure natural cycle and the modified natural cycle. So the reproductive outcome seems to be exactly the same for both uh, treatment modalities. However, what we saw in one of our secondary outcomes, which was the number of uh, visits to the clinic, uh, was that in case of triggering, so in case of the modified natural cycle, the patient needed to come once less um, to the center. On this last slide, I wanted to show you this data published uh, by the group of Professor Polisos uh, from Barcelona, in which they show that also in the natural cycle, there is an impact of the serum progesterone level around the moment of implantation. And that maybe not only for HRT cycles, but also in the natural cycles, we should take into account a certain threshold followed by an individualization with an increase of um, luteal phase support and maybe the adding uh, of uh, progesterone to increase the outcomes after frozen embryo uh, transfer. So in conclusion, and uh, to provide you with an answer on how to optimally prepare the endometrium for frozen embryo transfer, we can state that implantation is indeed the rate limiting step in ART today, with the embryo as the main determinant. On the other hand, the endometrium definitely plays a role and has to be receptive, but also selective. After an ovarian stimulation, if we want to perform a fresh embryo transfer, luteal phase support is crucial. And in the future, oral digrogesterone might take a more prominent place. As for the add-ons, we um, should perform correct uh, research. We should perform RCTs before we apply them into our clinical practice. For the freeze-all strategy, um, we can conclude that uh, probably we should not freeze-all for all, but we can definitely uh, perform a, a freeze-all um, approach in case of hyper-response without impacting on the reproductive outcomes and with a decrease uh, of the risk of OHSS. When we prepare for frozen embryo transfer, we cannot neglect the concerns with regard to the HRT. In this context, the natural cycle, whether it is a true natural cycle or a modified natural cycle, might serve as the first line frozen embryo transfer preparation uh, protocol in the future. We should further um, investigate whether we can optimize the luteal phase support uh, um, with an individualization linked to the uh, progesterone level around the moment uh, of embryo transfer. We know that certain cutoffs uh, have been published, have been confirmed, but publications are awaited on whether an increase in the luteal phase support or the adding of progesterone in a, a natural cycle will improve the outcomes. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions uh, in the Q&A session.
So now we want to go on to the second half of the talk. I want to spend the next 20 minutes talking about the technique of embryo transfer. How do we transfer that embryo into the chamber of secrets? Now, this is where it all began for me in the late 1980s when I was a research fellow at the University College Hospital in Middlesex Hospitals. And I received my training in this place, which is Bourne Hall, um, the first and oldest IVF unit in the world. And I remember doing my first embryo transfers with Robert Edwards, who's one of the founding fathers of, of IVF. And it was he who wanted to create the ideal atmosphere um, within the laboratory in which we could replace our embryos into the uterus. So he insisted that we transferred embryos in absolute silence and also in the dark um, to recreate the um, uterine environment before the embryo was replaced into the uterus. And so we used to um, literally um, transfer embryos in the most subdued of lighting um, with a strict code of silence within the um, within the theatre and the laboratory. And so 30 years later, the technique of embryo transfer still remains much of a mystery. It's the technique that is that has changed very little. It's extremely difficult to do, although technically you would think it was as quite easy. It's certainly the thing that, uh, that the, the, the procedure that most patients will remember um, most. And in, from my perspective, it is also the area where patients express most of their concerns. I mean, if you if you looked at the um, the, the two commonest areas of of uh, patient concern it one is is lack of communication within the clinic and number two are is events surrounding the embryo transfer so what i want to do over the next um 20 minutes or so is just to go through um some of the techniques that i've adopted over the years um and also to look at some of the evidence that some of us use and some of us don't use as to um the the, the uh, technique of embryo transfer and how we can optimize um outcomes so what i want to do first is just briefly deal with um loading embryos into the into the catheter this is not uh, strictly speaking the clinicians a responsibility but I've always been intrigued as to um, um, what sort of techniques we need to uh, to use in the laboratory to optimize delivery of the embryo um, volume of, of culture medium um, in particular so um, just very briefly um, my embryological colleagues have put this slide together for me um, there's no reported difference in pregnancy rates if loading from micro drops under oil. Um, there is a recommendation that rinsing the tip in the medium before transfer is to be uh, is to be advocated. Pre-warming the catheter is not recommended as the tip will be at an ambient temperature within seconds and heating may um, uh, may cause detriment to um, uh, to the embryo quality. Also, there's no clear evidence that flushing the catheter before loading improves outcomes, though most labs will do that. With reference to the culture medium in which we transfer the embryos, a high hyaluronic acid content appears to be beneficial. Um, the suggested possible benefit is due to the increased viscosity and um, higher protein concentrations, however, appear not to improve outcomes. When it comes to the volume of fluid within the uh, transfer catheter, um, the there's actually been relatively few randomized controlled trials um, on what transfer um, volume is best. Personally, I always like a little bit more so I can feel the plunger move as I um, transfer the embryo from the catheter into the uterine cavity. Um, but um, the only information that we have from these prospective studies is that less than 10 microliters may decrease implantation um, rates, whereas larger volumes may lead to expulsion of embryos to ectopic pregnancies or retention in the catheter. 
So ideally, um, 20 to 30 microliters within the uh, transfer catheter is the most commonly used um, vol are the most commonly used volumes. One study, however, has shown better outcomes um, in day three embryo transfers using 40 or 50 microliters compared with 15 or 20. There still exists debate about air gaps and how the embryo should be loaded within the catheter. But as can be seen from um, this study published in Fertility and Sterility in May 2004, the air in the transfer catheter does not seem to affect the success of the embryo transfer. So the next set, set of slides, um, I'm using um, evidence um, collected from the practice committee of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, which was um, that their findings were published in Fertility and Sterility in 2017. So I'm going to use a, um, um, some of their data and their findings are based on evidence obtained. So level one would be evidence from at least one well-designed prospective randomized tr controlled trial. Level two um, evidence would be well-designed cohort or case controlled analytic studies. Uh, or level three would be evidence from respected authorities based on clinical experience or descriptive studies or reports from expert committees. So with re reference to cervical mucus, do we remove it or not? So after we've we've um, fixed the cervix between the blades of our Cusco, Cusco speculum, so we've got the best view, um, the question is, is do we remove cervical mucus? Do we agitate the cervix? The, um, the cervix. Well, there is good evidence that removal of cervical mucus has a beneficial effect on embryo transfer outcome. Similarly, there is very good evidence that selecting the right type of embryo transfer um, catheter has an effect. Um, and many studies have been performed um, comparing various embryo uh, transfer catheters. And of course, a lot um, is, um, is down to um, operator preference. We all have our own um, favorite embryo transfer catheter. But clearly, um, outcomes are better when a soft embryo transfer catheter is used as opposed to a hard um, um, catheter. This is my um, particular favourite. Going back to the 1980s, um, we were all trained uh, using Wallace catheters. And so throughout my career, I've always used um, um, a Wallace catheter as I found, I've found that the generations of, of catheters um, soft, easy to use. This one in particular now um, is my particular favourite because not only is it is it a soft uh, catheter, it is ultrasonically highly visible for, so that we can I can see it very clearly during ultrasound guided embryo transfers. And it also has an inner stylet, which gives it a little bit of um, rigidity as you uh, pass it into the uterine cavity following um, successful uh, negotiation of the of the cervical canal. You can then remove the inner stylet and um, put your embryo catheter into it and place it exactly into the into the part of the uterine cavity where you want the embryo to land. And so now we come on to a particular hobby horse of mine: the importance of using ultrasound guidance. For many many years. Um, I used a, a no touch technique or a blind technique without the use of ultrasound guidance because I felt that I was able to um, negotiate the um, cervical canal and place my place the embryos into a catheter into the uh, uterine cavity um, safely without the added um, um, uh, use of ultrasound guidance. Um, but since the mid 2000s, there's been a wealth of evidence to confirm that 
by using ultrasound guidance to help guide your embryo transfer, um, this has significant um, improvement in outcomes over and above the no touch or, or blind technique. And I am now at a loss to understand how I could have possibly carried on all those years without the use of ultrasound because it makes the 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 uh, transfer so much easier. I know we've got plenty of um, you know advocates of uh, well I have plenty of experience and I don't I don't need ultrasound because I can um, I can you know I can I can negotiate the cervical canal and get into the endometrial cavity ex by by just my experience and and um, sense of touch but i liken it to a bit like uh, you know eating your dinner in the dark why why bother um, you know why would we um, um eat um, eat our lunch or dinner um in darkness when we could switch the light on and actually see what we're doing well, there's very few techniques um left in in surgery or gynecology where you um where, where you uh, perform the technique without uh, direct vision and the same applies to embryo transfer. And these are the sort of views you can now readily see using um, uh, transabdominal uh, ultrasound guided um, embryo transfers, very clearly visible with the, with the latest generation of, of embryo transfer um, catheters. This was um, a publication that I took a lot of um, notice of um, it appeared in the um, fertility and sterility journal in 2005 and the authors advocated a maximum implantation potential point which was one centimeter from the fundus of the um, of, of the um, uterine cavity and the deposition of the um, embryo was made um, at that point uh, which they advocated was the area at which the embryo had the mass, ma the, the maximum chance of of being um, or, or of undergoing successful implantation. And so here we are. These are the sort of pictures we can commonly see um, ultrasonically when we're doing an embryo transfer. Um, as you can see, the catheter uh, has been placed through the cervical canal and um, the embryo has been successfully uh, released in the endometrial cavity by the view of the um, uh, of the air bubbles. What I normally advocate is that the patient have a full bladder if the patient if the patient has an antiverted uterus and that um, has the effect of flattening out the um, uterus so that it makes the cervical canal easier to negotiate. Of course, if the patient has a um, a retroverted uterus, there's not much point in, in doing that. And then if we refer to the, um, the guidelines published by the National Institute of Clinical and Health, excellent. The guidelines for fertility were updated in 2017. And um, one of the guidelines that was published um, was that women undergoing IVF treatment should be offered ultrasound guided embryo transfer because this offers clear improvement in pregnancy rates. So we've placed the catheter into the um, endometrial cavity. We can see it on the ultrasound and we've got the tip of the catheter one centimeter from the uterine fundus one of the things that always intrigued me or one of the things that um that anecdotally i used to do was to um muse over how should we put the embryo transfer catheter in quickly or slowly but similarly should we retract after deposition of the embryo after expulsion of the embryo should we um leave the catheter in for a little while or should we um take it out straight away and i used to um um, work on the basis that I, I'd like to um, expel the embryo and then leave the, um, the the catheter there or thereabouts for 15 20 seconds to give the the, um, the embryo chance to to float away well trials have actually shown that not to be the case and in fact there's good evidence that again was published uh, by um, in the um, by the by, Association of Reproductive Medicine, 
group um, that removal of the catheter immediately after deposition results in better outcomes. So I've changed my practice now that once the embryo has been released into the endometrial cavity, one centimetre from the fundus, you immediately withdraw um, the, the catheter, as this has shown to improve pregnancy rates. Going back to my um, time at Bourne Hall, we used to have a common policy that all patients having undergone an embryo transfer should have bed rest as an inpatient in Bourne Hall for 48 hours, preferably in the head down position. And I remember um, doing ward rounds, um, you know, 24 hours post embryo transfer. And we used to all gather around the bed and see the patient. How are you? Um, and the, the, the patient would respond and uh, would say any, any symptoms. And a majority of them would say, well, yeah, I've got a headache. Is it any wonder? Because they were, um, they were, they were lying with their head down for 48 hours. Well, that has subsequently been dis disproven. And um, there's, there's plenty of evidence to suggest now that early ambulation following embryo transfer is actually beneficial with regard to outcome. We shouldn't be asking patients necessarily to lie down for any amount of time after an embryo transfer. In fact, um, there is um, evidence now to suggest that immediately after the embryo transfer, it is to their benefit um, if they get up and um, move around. The human factor. Does the operator performing the embryo transfer significantly impact the cycle outcome? Well, unsurprisingly, there is very little data to support this. But, you know, as you and I will know, um, we know um, good embryo transferers. We know not so good embryo transferers. A lot, a lot of it is down to um, technique, but also um, experience. The more you do, the better you get at, you get at it. Um, and that's fairly standard, although it, do, it won't appear in any prospective randomised controlled trials that I could find. But if you use the um, golfing analogy, this is the, the, the back of Dustin Johnson. And you golfers in the audience will know that um, this, this chap won an important uh, competition just recently. Now, he may have the best quality handmade, made to measure golf club. Um, and he also may have the balls that um, that uh, fly the furthest. But um, irrespective of the tools that he has, the golf balls and the, um, the golf club, it's the operator himself, Dustin Johnson himself, that has to swing the club and hit the ball. So it's fairly obvious that um, you can develop a certain expect, uh, expertise by practice and experience. But um, there's no denying that um, some skill is of benefit as well. What about difficult transfers? Well, I find this um, a difficult one. Um, really, we should um, um, we, we should absolutely minimize um, the incidence of difficult transfers. You say, well, you know, um, occasionally or sometimes you just they, they're just unavoidable. But preparation is the um, the, the, the best um, approach to this because, you know, we only have to take a history, um, certainly from, uh, you know, a past history of, of previ previous cervical surgery or previous difficult transfers or previous cervical sten um, stenosis. Um, you know, if we, take a, if we take a good enough history, we should be able to address any particular problems of difficult tran transfers. As I said before, uh, that, you know, may not always be the case, but what I do is if, if there's been a previous um, difficult transfer um, or a, a tight um, cervical os, well, use the opportunity in a preceding cycle to dilate the, the cervix or do, you know, just do a, um, a trial catheter. So at least you can prepare and minimise the, um, the, the incidence of difficult transfers, because once you've got the catheter in your hand and you've prepared... Um, the cervix to remove the cervical mucus, the last thing you want is for that embryo um, transfer catheter to, 
to, to not go through the cervical loss. So really preparation is everything. As I said before, you can't, you know, you might not always be successful um, in reducing the incidence to zero, but at least you can significantly reduce um, the incidence by taking a good history and preparing the cervix beforehand. So, grade A evidence, ultrasound guided embryo transfer, use a soft embryo transfer catheter, and no need for bed rest. These are the highest quality evidence when um, um, advocating optimizing outcomes for embryo transfer. Grade B evidence. Acupuncture is of little benefit. As I haven't mentioned it in the book of my talk and we could talk about that in the questions um, afterwards, but acupuncture is of little benefit. Antibiotics are of little benefit. In fact, there's fair evidence to suggest that antibiotics themselves have very little um, uh, positive effect. Um, removing cervical mucus is fair evidence not great evidence but there is some evidence to suggest that um, um, as I mentioned in the bulk of the um, of, of the talk that removing it does improve outcomes placement of the embryo one centimeter from the uterine fundus fair evidence and immediate withdrawal of the embryo transfer catheter after um, expulsion of the embryo fair grade B evidence Grade C evidence, um, there is very little evidence to suggest any benefit by using analgesics in, um, the, in, uh, during the process of embryo transfer. Similarly, anesthesia, complementary therapies such as massage therapy, insufficient evidence to, to uh, suggest one way or another it could be of benefit. Similarly, blood on the catheter. Um, there is insufficient evidence, although this is quite surprising to me, that um, if you have to withdraw the embryo transfer catheter, there is evidence of, um, of blood staining um, on the catheter. But that doesn't seem to, uh, we have insufficient evidence to say whether that's a positive or negative. And finally, um, the injection speed. I always thought that putting embryos back as gently as possible um, with a slow um, pressure on the on the um, expulsion catheter um, syringe would um, is ideal but that doesn't seem to be the case in fact there there is insufficient evidence to suggest that um, um, any differing pressures can adversely affect outcome so finally these are the myths acupuncture analgesics prophylactic antibiotics expulsion speed and waiting after expulsion and as a prologue to the chamber of secrets and i hope that this um, will help to help you in optimizing your embryo transfer um, outcomes and get you to the top of the uh, leaderboard in your clinic Number one, use ultrasound. Number two, remove the cervical mucus before embryo transfer. Careful placement of the embryo one centimeter from the uterine fundus. Immediate withdrawal of the embryo uh, transfer catheter after expulsion. And early ambulation of the patient after embryo transfer. And if you follow those um, guidance together with your, uh, your own um, little anecdotes, together with a bit of luck, that should optimize your outcomes for embryo transfer.